Hello, I'm Louise Minchin. Welcome to The Hidden Heart, a programme produced by ITN Business in partnership with British Heart Foundation. Heart and circulatory diseases affect around 7.6 million people in the UK and are responsible for one in four of all deaths. In this programme, we look at the research and commercial innovations that are tackling these diseases and conditions, improving patient outcomes and offering hope for the future. I'm joined now in the studio by British Heart Foundation Chief Executive, Dr. Charmaine Griffiths. Welcome. First of all, tell us about your role at British Heart Foundation. Lovely to be here. Um, so I'm uh, Charmaine, my privilege to be Chief Executive of the British Heart Foundation, leading just the most magical organisation absolutely dedicated to tackling heart and circulatory diseases. Since 1962, the BHF has been absolutely behind huge investment in cardiovascular research to drive discoveries and make progress in diagnosis and treatment and care that has made phenomenal advances. Things that we take for granted every day, like the treatments we take for for high cholesterol like statins or things like heart surgery or implantable defibrillators have all been part of BHF's kind of progress. And so we're really proud for over six decades to have been driving that as an organisation. And going forward, how is BHF funded research making use of what is now cutting edge technology? Well, we always have actually, as every new technology emerges over the decades, BHF's been investing in the very best people and ideas and talent to, to make the most of that, to look for how it can be applied to to help save and improve more lives. And there are a couple of great examples right now. And um, one is that we're using AI to help predict heart attacks before they even happen, which I think is absolutely incredible. And the other um, brilliant example is we're investing 30 million pounds in the most incredible program called Cure Heart, which aims for the first time in human history to genetically cure inherited cardiomyopathies, diseases of the heart muscle. And that at the moment is so important because it causes sudden death um, in life and devastates families, of course, beyond belief. And we know that there are around 30 million people around the world living with that right now. So we're deeply passionate about making that progress happen for them. Really interesting. In addition to funding research, how does BHF influence change and what impact do you think it could have? So we've always been proud to be the voice of the 7.6 million people living in the UK with cardiovascular diseases right now. And historically, we've been behind real uh, advances in looking after people's heart health, whether that be making sure that CPRs in the curriculum across the four nations, um, helping lobby to, to ban cigarette vending machines to children, or indeed making sure that uh, we've got organ donation that's available to everybody who needs it for, for their hearts. So that's been part of our story. And at the moment, one of the things that's most pressing for us is there are 400,000 people in the queue post-pandemic desperately waiting for treatment and care that's delayed. And that's the highest it's ever been historically. So we're using our voice and our advocacy to try and make sure that the people who need it get the care they can as soon as possible. World Heart Day is on the 29th of September. Why is it important to raise awareness of what BHF is doing with hidden heart health issues? Well, do you know, so many people are living with cardiovascular disease and don't know it, and those hidden conditions totally devastate families when they hit, and they can happen at all ages. So it's really important that we use moments like World Heart Day to shine a light on those hidden conditions. Um, and we don't do that in isolation. So we as a BHF, uh, since our foundation, have been really proud to support countless families here in the UK. But the impact of our research and the discoveries we've made extend far beyond that. And we're really proud to be a founding member of the European Heart Network and the Global Cardiovascular Research Funders Forum that unite all of the sister organizations focused on making a difference for people with heart health around the world. And this is a perfect day to both celebrate that and urge people to support the work that we do that saves and improves just so many lives. Dr. Charmaine Griffiths, thank you very much. Thank you. Aortic stenosis is when the aortic valve cannot open fully, leading to an interference with the normal blood flow out of the heart. Without treatment, severe aortic stenosis can cause heart failure and may eventually be fatal. Edward Life Sciences offers a solution through valves that are used in transcatheter aortic valve implantation, TAVI, a minimally invasive procedure allowing efficient treatment 
and fast recovery. Okay, so it's very, very important that you, that you lie still. Okay. You're observing the cutting edge of cardiology. This is one of the UK's elite specialist heart centres. Ready for the valve. We've been granted exclusive access to witness one of their advanced medical procedures. So right now in this laboratory, this patient is about to undergo a procedure which could transform his life. They're about to insert a small valve through his leg all the way up to his heart. The procedure is called TAVI, which stands for Transcatheter Aortic Valve Implantation. It's an alternative to open heart surgery and it's far less invasive, which means that patient's recovery time is considerably shorter. Some patients undergo the procedure after being diagnosed with severe aortic stenosis. So aortic stenosis is a common degenerative condition of one of the major heart valves. And as one gets older with time or with an abnormal valve, uh, the valve can become calcified and stenosed and narrowed. And if left untreated, that condition can progress really fairly rapidly to cause the pump or the heart to fail and is associated with a risk of death. Aortic stenosis sufferers experience breathlessness and increasingly find it difficult to exercise and complete normal tasks. If the disease reaches the severe stage and is untreated, the life expectancy for sufferers can be as little as two years following diagnosis. Patients may require urgent treatment. For a minute until we say, no Today, consultant cardiologist Mick Oscor is leading his team to complete this procedure. In this procedure, they're fully awake and they have it minimally invasive by a little uh, incision into the groin and via that, we managed to push their valve to the sides and put a brand new valve in. Hello, Doctor. Hello, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. Good. The rest looking okay? Shortly after his procedure this morning, patient Barry Sylvester from North London was able to talk to Mick. Absolutely, yeah. Really I'm just well. grateful for what you guys did, so yeah, thank you very much. I was more concerned about having to open heart surgery for it as opposed to Tabby when they explained the differences in the risks. So I chose to have Tabby which I thought was more suited to me as well. And it all went well. So. The valve used in Barry's procedure was manufactured by Edwards Life Sciences. At a time when NHS waiting lists for cardiac surgery have increased substantially, having a treatment option with shorter recovery time, as well as a reduced length of stay in hospital, is welcomed. If you uh, focus more on doing a procedure like this, where you spend less time in hospital, you could do more of those procedures. On an average day, we do four of these procedures. We could do, in the same time frame, five or maybe six in a day. Um, and by doing this, we then open up the ability for the operations to do different operations to reduce that waiting list. Four years ago, Anne Metcalf was suffering from aortic stenosis. She didn't want to have open heart surgery. The TAVI procedure offered an opportunity she was keen to take. So immediately, as soon as the valve went in, yeah. you felt better straight away? I did. I can't explain it to you. I was almost like being reborn. I, I know that sounds sort of a bit Hollywood and all that, but it did. I knew then that I was better. I didn't know I was really ill before, but when the valve went in, I knew that I was better. Anne remains in good health following her procedure. Dr John Byrne says many other patients could benefit from TAVI, but are unable to do so. Huge amount of work to do. There's a huge amount of unmet need. And just to put that in perspective, the estimates put about 200,000 people in the UK who have significant valvular heart disease estimated. We treat a tiny proportion of those every year, probably under 2,000 as a nation. So that's, these are small numbers, and we are really going to have to double or triple that provision over the next three to five years if we're going to deliver the care that these patients need.
For now, Anne has some advice for other patients. Don't self-medicate. Don't think to yourself, oh, I've got this. Don't Google. Don't Google your symptoms. Go to those who know. Up to 45% of all heart attacks are silent, meaning the classic symptoms such as chest pain or difficulty with breathing are not present. Fourth Frontier has developed Frontier X2, a wearable monitoring device that offers continuous, detailed, real-time feedback into your heart's performance, including heart rate and respiratory data. I'm joined in the studio by Fourth Frontier co-founder Manav Bhushan and by world-class champion runner Paula Radcliffe to discuss the game-changing technology. Lovely to see you both. Thanks so much. So Manaf, let's start talking about heart attacks because they're not always the sort of dramatic thing we see on television, are they? Yes, absolutely. Like you said, 45% uh, of heart attacks are actually silent. That means the person who's having the heart attack has no idea that this has happened. And the prognosis for those people with silent heart attacks is much worse than people who have symptoms because they don't get treatment in time. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely important to monitor your heart continuously and where possible measure the ECG to see if there are any changes that might be indicative of uh, heart issues. So we know that lots of things play into heart health, uh, lifestyle choices like diet, like exercise, like not smoking, for example, they can have a huge impact. Um, but what about heart monitoring? How would that help? So, you know, we, we've had several users who are able to monitor their continuous ECG and then see the effects of smoking, of alcohol, of uh, poor sleep on their ECG. Now everyone knows that smoking is bad for you, but mm -hmm. when you can actually see the effects directly on the ECG and the frequency of rhythm changes, then it makes it uh, much easier for that person to make lifestyle changes and make healthier choices. So we do have many devices in the market mm -hmm. which allow users to take a spot check of their ECG. but. If that is the equivalent of a still camera, then what we are offering is a CCTV camera, which allows you to record your ECG continuously for up to 24 hours while you're sleeping, while you're exercising, while you're doing any kind of activity. And this enables you to catch the 85% of arrhythmias, which are actually asymptomatic, where the user doesn't know that anything abnormal is happening. Um, Paula, I know that you're, you know, you're an incredible athlete, you're an endurance athlete, you've used this, so how does it help you? Um, I think in many ways it helps me. Um, first of all, given the, the career I'd had running competitively since I was nine or ten, all the way through and pushing my body, pushing my heart hard through that, I think for me the first thing was peace of mind. So I remember the first run that Manav took me on was actually at the Great North Run and um, we then went I went for a run with the monitor on and just to get the feedback that yes, you haven't damaged your heart, it's in good condition at the moment. And then to be able to regularly check in on that is vital um, to me. And then I saw the benefits after I had COVID um, because I could myself monitor that my heart wasn't behaving normally um, as I returned to running. So to make that a really gradual, slow return. And then I have little things that I monitor now. Um, and then it also helped me with, with my mum as well. I'll come to your mum in a minute. What I want you to do, Manav, is also show me the bit of the, some of the data that, for example, Paula's been able to look at as well. Have you explained what we've yeah. got here? So this is our live user dashboard. And this was recorded last week when Paula was in the UK and I was in India. And this shows you the heart rate, breathing rate, heart strain for everyone who's using the device mm -hmm. at that minute. And now this is our live ECG dashboard, which actually allows a third party or a doctor to view your ECG while you're streaming it mm -hmm. live. And this can be used for teleconsultations and for uh, guiding people through a cardiac rehabilitation program. And this is what an individual's dashboard looks like. So it shows you a list of all your recordings with the total duration, the total training load, the maximum heart strain, and a rhythm pie chart showing you the percentage of time that you spent in normal versus other rhythm. And if you go into any particular recording, then you can actually scroll through the entire ECG while you look at the heart rate graph. Um, you found this, you mentioned with your mum. So how did that help her? 
Well, my mum was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation uh, in 2019. So I immediately got a monitor on her um, and that helped her to work together with her cardiologist and really came into its own during the pandemic because of course she couldn't go and see her cardiologist then, but she could send him the ECG mm. readings that she'd done, the workouts there, and they could keep tinkering with the medication that she was on to kind of settle it down. So it's now, I mean, she'll be managing it for life but it's now settled down to a level that keeps her reassured and settled and helps me being separated and far away from her as well. And then she wanted to go on a singles walking holiday through Cornwall and Manav and the team were very kind and worked with her on a, a training programme really to make sure that her heart stayed healthy enough to be able to do that. Thank you so much for talking about it. And what's extraordinary about this is it's on the one hand you've got someone like your mum mm -hmm. and then you've got someone like you. So this is technology that sort of spans an enormous range of people. Mm -hmm. And what do you think? And I'm fascinated because I'm an endurance athlete as well, um, not like you. But what do you think the sort of future of it is? 48% of adults suffer from some form of cardiovascular disease. And my family is representative of that. So we really built this device to enable any adult to really take control of their own cardiac health and lead a longer and healthier life. Gosh, thank you both so much for talking about it. Mana Bushan and Paula Radcliffe, thank you so thank much. You. Each day in the UK, around 13 babies are diagnosed with congenital heart disease. British Heart Foundation is funding groundbreaking research at the Evelina Children's Hospital in London, where Professor John Simpson and his team are using cutting edge virtual reality technology to help repair tiny hearts. So this is an ultrasound image of the heart, which uses a technology where they, you can see um, 3D image. Stepping into a whole new dimension using a headset and hand controls, you'd be forgiven for thinking this is a new gaming concept. But what you're seeing is cutting edge heart virtual reality that could raise the game in the way congenital heart conditions are treated in patients. So here I'm cutting in from the left hand side. I can now turn this round and show you the valve from a different projection. So essentially you can now walk through the heart. With research funded by British Heart Foundation, this groundbreaking technology is being tested and applied at the Evelina London Children's Hospital, led by Professor John Simpson. So what we've done is take the standard images, that's from CT, MRI or echocardiography, which are normally seen like on a flat television screen, and we've been taking those images into virtual reality so they give a true, moving, dynamic, three-dimensional representation of the heart, which is a, a three-dimensional, moving, beating organ to uh, really transform the type of imaging which we can give to cardiologists and surgeons before they undertake any procedures. And that translates into fewer complications, better uh, selection of procedures, and we hope shorter hospital stay with a better outcome for the longer term. Congenital heart diseases affect almost one in 100 babies born in the UK. Around 13 babies are diagnosed each day in the country with a congenital heart condition. And surgery to correct these conditions can be complex, especially in babies and children who are likely to require repeated surgeries. And that is why British Heart Foundation say funding translational research is critical into pioneering techniques like Heart VR to find ways to correct these conditions. The process of going from the light bulb moment, if you like, to the product is translational research. And I think what we've recognised, along with many others, is that we've funded lots and lots and lots of brilliant science that, and there have been thousands of light bulb moments, but not enough of those have ended up in a product in the clinic that's helping patients. So to expand that pipeline and make sure that more of those discoveries get through into the clinic, we now set up a programme to fund translational research. Luke Jensen-Jones and his mum Karen know only too well the complications of living with a heart condition. 
Luke was operated on the day he was born and then again at three and six months before another major surgery at four years old. Yeah, so we were told that um, Luke's heart was, it was in the right place, um, but the right side was underdeveloped. Um, so that would obviously cause problems the moment he came out of the womb, so that he would have to have an operation straight away um, to rectify that. Um, and that would be a little shunt that would be um, put into the heart. I can never really remember a time before I knew I had a heart condition. It's just been something that's always been a part of who I am and, and, and life, really. But, you know, certainly to begin with growing up, things like hospital visits and, you know, getting blood tests and taking medication were just a sort of part of life that I had to deal with. I think as you got older and you know, certain things started to become more difficult or you know more disruptive, um, you know, certainly things like you know taking part in sport, which was you know harder, and, and things like stamina became an issue. Twenty-year-old Luke is now living life to the full and is part of a clinical trial. He says innovative technologies like VR for heart conditions in children is crucial, and would have been incredible when he was growing up. So I think certainly if that was something that you could sort of, you know, reduce and, and you know, have fewer operations and have them earlier, that would be a really beneficial thing for, for young people with the condition. British Heart Foundation is the largest non-commercial funder of cardiovascular research in the UK, funding around £100 million worth of research projects every year. Now when I turn it and look down from the top. And experts say the impact of this new technology has also enabled collaborative thinking, allowing multiple heart specialists to share one screen around the world. You can collaborate with a surgeon on another continent together looking at the images, you can rotate it around, you can put your stent in, the surgeon can turn it around, he can try say show where he will cut, where he will put a patch, and then you between you decide which is best for the patient. And very importantly, from the British Heart Foundation, there's research support, which is not simply about blue sky research, but actually translating from uh, clinical research right through to bringing products into the marketplace, delivering this as to be the standard of care in the future. British Heart Foundation say through funding independent research programmes, they are working to create a world free from the fear of heart and circulatory disease. But they need continued support to make their vision a reality. Pulmonary embolism occurs when a blood clot blocks a blood vessel in the lungs. If not treated quickly, it can lead to heart failure. Inari Medical has designed a life-saving device that's able to safely and effectively remove blood clots from pulmonary arteries, giving patients another chance at life. Vanessa is a journalist with a love of adventure, but over a period of just five months, she went from being fit and healthy to struggling to breathe. Vanessa, tell me how bad did it get? So just before I went into hospital, if I went out of the bathroom here, I'd walk into the living room and I'd be so out of breath, I'd actually have to sit down and catch my breath for about five minutes before I could, you know, just breathe again. Vanessa had pulmonary embolism, a clot in the artery in her lungs, blocking blood flow to part of the lung. The prognosis from her NHS consultant was a shock. I actually asked him to give me the figures. Um, and what he told me was that there was a 20 to 30% chance of death within a month if I didn't do anything. And that's when it sank in. Now, typically that clot originates from the legs. Um, so you may have been on a long haul flight, uh, you may have sort of had a period of illness where you're bed bound and that means that the legs will develop a blood clot in the vein. Occasionally that blood clot can move from the leg and sort of dislodge and go up to the heart and then into the lungs. Pulmonary embolism is the third most common cause of cardiovascular disease after heart attack and stroke. It's also the number one cause of preventable deaths in hospitals. It's shocking because everyone's heard of stroke. Everyone's heard of um, heart attacks, but not many people have heard of a pulmonary embolism. 
Symptoms include a shortness of breath, chest pain, coughing, feeling lightheaded and an irregular heartbeat. Some have no symptoms. Just before I went into hospital, I could feel that my arms seemed like, like jelly. I mean, you know, there didn't seem to be any oxygen getting to them. And so my arms just felt really heavy. So I started putting them into my coat pockets because I, I just couldn't carry them. I waited for a long time. Um, and because it was fairly gradual, it wasn't until the day that I had to sit down in a shower that I was so exhausted just having a shower that I sat down because I thought I might faint. So you can see just how big that clot is. Treatments vary. There's blood thinning and clot busting medication. But as Vanessa's clot was older, medication would be less effective. Dr. Akta advised a thrombectomy. He used the Inari medical flow treever device to remove the clot. The device is essentially a long bit of purple plastic tubing that's really flexible and that goes from the groin up through the heart and into the lungs. And what that allows for is um, it's so flexible and so um, malleable that it doesn't damage any of the structures it's going through, but at the same time it allows for us to suck the clot out like a vacuum. We aim to suck out enough clot so that the pressure on the heart when it's pumping blood to the lungs and the pressure on the lungs so that it can oxygenate the blood is relieved. The procedure was under local anaesthetic. Some patients feel instant relief. For Vanessa, the wow moment happened a few days later. And when I got up and stood up, I suddenly felt this rush of air th go through my lungs. And that was amazing. That was just after five months of not being able to take a deep breath, to feel suddenly that burst of air going into that lung that had been cleared. Just was really, really marvellous. The very sad thing about it is that I would say the vast majority of institutions in the UK do not have this uh, treatment option available to them. Over time, Vanessa built up her stamina. This is her tackling stairs for the first time after the treatment. She's back doing what she loves, enjoying life's adventures, determined to live life as before. People needing heart surgery, including valve replacement or bypass grafts, may need a cardiopulmonary bypass machine, also known as a perfusion system. Operated by skilled perfusionists, these machines temporarily take over the function of the heart and lungs, while surgery happens on non-beating hearts. Global medical device company Levanova have worked with the perfusion community to develop an integrated next generation perfusion system that supports perfusionists in tailoring care to the needs of each patient. You're watching Open Heart Surgery, a life-saving procedure made possible by the hidden heroes of cardiopulmonary bypass. My name is Stephen Robbins. I'm a clinical perfusion manager here at New Cross Hospital in Wolverhampton. A perfusionist is integral, really, to the whole of cardiac surgery. A highly trained healthcare professional who's responsible for the heart-lung machine and all the associated equipment uh, that goes with it and responsible for the monitoring and maintenance of cardiopulmonary bypass. The surgeon requires cardiopulmonary bypass really to give them a still, clear operating field. You can't have the heart moving around, you can't have the lungs in the way, and you can't have fluids and blood around getting in their way. So what we have to do is isolate the heart, we isolate the lungs, and this device then provides the functions of the heart and the lung. The function of the heart is replaced by a mechanical pump. The lungs are replaced by quite a large membrane which is compressed into a small space and gas exchange happens over that membrane. This oxygenated blood supports the body's vital organs so the heart can be stopped while the surgeon operates. Without a perfusion it would be very difficult to do the majority of the heart operations. Uh, they all of them rely on the cardiopulmonary bypass and the cardiopulmonary bypass is run by the perfusionist. 
There's no doubt uh, since the first uh, bypass in the 1950s uh, uh, that there's a massive evolution in the machines. They're much smaller in size, so less uh, space occupying, better management of, uh, of the temperature, and uh, they have independent flows for uh, specific procedures. These evolving surgical needs inform the development of Essence, Levanova's next generation perfusion system. The Essence perfusion system has been designed with more than 300 perfusionists worldwide and uh, we really had the main goal uh, to assist uh, a perfusionist uh, with um, a safe and reliable uh, product. So I would say that safety and reliability have been uh, really two big milestones for us, like flexibility and intuitiveness. The most innovative piece of this system is uh, everything is related to the graphical user interface and the user interaction with the system itself. And uh, we have run um, a lot of studies in order to understand which was the best way to display, for instance, information during the case in order to facilitate the perfusionist to clearly understand what, was, what is going on. And at the same time, we have invested a lot in a software platform that of of course is uh, scalable and that can be improved um, and um, can um, allow us then to add, add additional features and functionalities. This ability to upgrade software will future-proof Essence, but it's the involvement of clinicians during every stage of development which ensures the new system meets the needs of the user. It's critical. Um, each colleague brings a different, a different aspect. They may have different interests, they may do different types of surgery or, or different types of bypass. And so each person brings a different aspect to the machine which, which the device manufacturer may not have thought about. There's a certain amount of data that we need as a cardiac surgical team to discuss how we can improve patient care. We're able to print the data out, we're able to look at the whole patient pathway. This access to information is evolving the perfusionist's role from technical to more data-focused, helping to improve patient outcomes. The system also embed uh, algorithms and uh, formulas that allow the perfusionist to uh, always uh, look at uh, the metabolic needs of the patient and then uh, thanks to data, the perfusionist is facilitated in taking informed decision during the case. An added reassurance for the over one million patients globally who require open heart procedure every year. Uh, you can say the surgeon is the brain uh, and the uh, perfusion is the heart. Uh, you can't live without either, okay? So it's 100% uh, important for any cardiopulmonary bypass operation to have the perfusionist. And you can't do it without a good perfusionist also and a good machine. I'm joined now remotely by BHF funded researcher Dr. Lorena Hill and also by Alan Owen who has survived a cardiac arrest and thanks both for joining us. Alan first of all just tell us a little bit about what happened to you. Yeah my life changed in 2022. I was playing football at Caldicott Leisure Centre which is about an hour and a half from my house in Carmarthen. I was playing in a, a walking football tournament and we played the first game which is about a 10 minute sort of six aside game and I was stood talking next to a, a colleague and I collapsed in front of him. I had no symptoms beforehand. Luckily for me, he was a police officer, an ex-police officer. He turned me over and put me in a recovery position. And another colleague of mine who I was playing foot with, who was an ex-army officer, came over and saw that my heart had stopped and I had no pulse. So started CPR immediately. Our football manager called 999, which then the people at the staff at the Caldecott Leisure Centre came running across to the pitch with a defibrillator. They gave me three shocks of the defib within eight minutes of me, my heart stopping. Then an air ambulance landed within 20 minutes and a first responder called Ruby came out and assessed me and realised that I was in a, a poor condition and needed to be ventilated on the field. So they sent another air ambulance out, which arrived with a doctor on board to give me a general anaesthetic and knock me out and put me on a, a ventilator. And then I was taken to Cardiff Hospital by road ambulance. 
So a very traumatic situation. And I know, Dr Hill, you work with patients like Alan, who was then fitted with what's called an ICD. So tell us about ICDs and also your research that you're doing with the BHF. So the ICD is a small matchstick box sized device which is implanted below the left collarbone in, in the muscle. Um, it's got a, a number of key functions. Its main function really is to shock or to, to give a discharge when the heart has a life-threatening arrhythmia. And for example, the, the situation with Alan, this is then implanted to prevent him having this life-threatening arrhythmia again. For other patients, for example, patients with heart failure, they may get the device implanted prophylactically to prevent them experiencing a collapse like Alan has des described. The research that is funded by the BHF will develop an app. This app will provide them key information, easy to understand information that will be accessible to them on the functions of the device and how the device, how they can adapt to living with the device now that they have one. And then back to you, because it sounds incredibly lucky that what happened happened where it did. So what were you diagnosed with and how did it get to having an ICD and how did you find coping with it? So I was diagnosed with a, a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a thickening of the heart walls, which means that the heart doesn't pump as efficiently as it should. So it was recommended to me by the cardiologist at Cardiff Hospital that I have an ICD fitted. And it was explained to me by an ICD nurse what it would do. And it sounds really scary having this device implanted underneath your skin with two leads running to your heart um, and undergoing that procedure. But it would be there to support me and to go through the, the trauma that I'd had. And then that 11 days from having two stents fitted, having the cardiac arrest, to being told that you need an ICD. It's a lot to take in at that time for the family and the friends, but it's meant that it's given me a new lease of life in, in terms of I'm in a much better position than I was before. You know, I was a ticking time bomb before that I didn't know. And now I've got an ICD that controls and I'm on medication and I know the condition that I have and I live within the means of that condition. Yeah, and it's great to see that you are okay. Back to you, Dr. Hill. Why is your research so important and what impact can it have on patients like Alan? So there's about 5,000 devices of these devices implanted in the UK every year. And with our current situation, many professionals do not have the time to spend with patients, giving them detailed information. So therefore, this app will give them very detailed evidence-based information in a way that they can understand. They will be able to access it at any time. It will be via an app. They will have uh, different options, either to read it, animation, patient stories via videos. So it will really give them a lot of information, not just what's provided to them during either their hospital stay or clinic consultation. And the content of it will be decided by patients for patients. So it will be extremely important. And I think it will make a real difference to patients like Alan in terms of their quality of life and how they adapt to living with a device. And why does funding from the BHF make such a difference to your work? Because it really has given me protected time for my current post in Queen's University to dedicate to this project which has really came from clinical practice. And it's a real boost as a nurse, as a heart failure nurse, to get this, because often nurses, allied professionals, don't have the opportunity to step out of their normal daily work and dedicate research, dedicate time to do research on projects that they really think is of value to themselves, their patients and their profession. Alan, explain to us why Dr Hill's research and what she's doing is so important to patients like you with an ICD. When you get fitted with an ICD, it's life changing. And you know, you've just done, for me, I've undergone a real traumatic experience and so have my family. And then you're bombarded with information. You need to ensure that you've got the correct information in order to be able to understand what this device will do. And this research and this app will give not just the patient, but will give the friends and family all the information that's needed about an ICD. You've made a really good case for it. Alan Owen, thank you very much. Good luck with your continued recovery. And uh, Dr. Lorena Hill, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Heart attacks that strike without warning are just one of the many cruelties of cardiovascular disease. Healthcare solution supplier Mindray believe that every life is valuable and they're responding to the needs of the medical community by developing and sharing innovative technology that will help every heart. He's just a lovely lad. Everybody liked Daniel. He was sport mad. And that's why I think it was such a shock, because he, he was such a, a sporty person in the best of health. Daniel Shermer was just 43 when he died at home from a sudden cardiac arrest. At the cricket ground in Hartlepool where he played, he's remembered fondly by all those who knew him. But his legacy could also save the lives of many more who didn't. For his mum and dad, supported by the ambulance first responder who was there that night, raised money to install three defibrillators on the estate where Daniel lived, and then started to see where else in the town they might be needed. Initially we thought we might be able to raise a bit more and possibly put ten in, and then we really got into it and started mapping the town and where they needed to be to try and get everyone within. Initially it was a 500 metre radius. But as time has gone on, we're now looking at a 350 metre radius because 500 metres is still a long way if you need to get one of these in a hurry. At the end of the day, all we're trying to do is, is try and give people the best chance of survival. Daniel's parents have also organised awareness raising and training sessions within the community on how to use the defibrillators, which include the newest generation of AED from Mindray. I think it's great for the town, great for the community, so people know where they are. And, well, if it saves one life, that's everything. If it saves more, it's even more of everything. This is the latest of nearly 50 defibs to be installed right across Hartlepool. And in the space of just two years, in total, they've been deployed more than 500 times. But these machines also play a crucial role in a hospital setting. The Royal Papworth in Cambridge is the largest specialist cardiothoracic hospital in the UK and has worked with Mindray to develop a bespoke, fully connected monitoring solution for patients. So the Mindray Benehart D30 Defib collects data every time it's used to give insights into how well a resus has gone. And the Benevision N1 monitor can be unplugged from its larger N15 bedside monitor to follow the patient throughout their care journey. So it's more than just the hardware on the wall, it's also the software behind that. So it's calculating the scores based on an algorithm, and it's not only doing that, it's transmitting that across both to the central nurses station, but it's also sending it to the electronic patient record, so they don't have to record it anywhere. And the other thing it does is it sends it to our critical care outreach team, who then act upon all the high uh, news scores and see those patients, treat them, make sure they don't deteriorate. So we can have a slightly different view of the heart. This close collaboration between Mindray and the Royal Papworth Hospital is also delivering solutions tailored to its unique patient population. They support us with our ultrasound equipment and trying to enhance some of the functions that we've got. We've also had um, some collaboration recently with Mindray to improve some of the bedside monitoring that we have to look at um, the patients that we have with mechanical assist devices um, and how we can make some modifications to the monitoring so that we can actually look after the patients a little bit more closely. We do listen to our customers. There's that experience sharing all the time and that and that route for improvement because we are constantly trying to refresh technology but actually asking the questions, going to the customer and asking what challenges, what the obstacles are, how we can improve that and how we can ultimately improve care. It's a vision that's transformed Mindre into a global leading developer and manufacturer of healthcare solutions supporting better heart health both within clinical settings and the community and delivering more positive outcomes for patients.
By being more physically active, we can reduce our risk of heart and circulatory diseases by up to 35%. Pure Gym are working in partnership with British Heart Foundation to inspire people to improve their heart health, including launching the free Healthy Hearts programme on the Pure Gym app. Again, really squeeze here. There you go. The shock of hearing her high blood pressure could mean a life on medication told Wendy it was time for action. So the doctor was a bit, well, oh, okay then, I'll give you I'll give you two months and then you've got to come back and have it tested again. But if it doesn't come down, then you're gonna to have to go on medication. After getting the nod from her doctor to do so, Wendy began at Pure Gym. And I started off very, very slowly, very slow, and just started going and building up from there. Ready? The classes, the, you know, there's people there, they're encouraging each other, you know, they say, oh, come on, have a go, you know, come on, you can do it, it'll be okay. You know, or, or it's great, because then you're starting to make friends. One thing we really pride ourselves on here at Pure Gym is that community. It's non-intimidating, it's a welcome space, and everybody's like you, just trying to make themselves a little bit healthier and achieve a, their own personal goal. We have a Healthy Hearts programme that we've built with British Hearts Foundation that's available inside our app. We also have loads of educational resources in there for people to look at and read and understand more about the importance of living this healthy, well-being lifestyle that we want everyone to embrace. When Pure Gym talk to their members, the emphasis is much more on how they are feeling and improving their physical health rather than focusing on their appearance. I have a woman who loves to walk and she just wants to get stronger um, rather than lose any weight or she just wants to maintain what she's got her health at the minute and I think that's great rather than the pressure to look a certain way. Wendy's doing great, um, so it's been great to see her kind of improving her confidence in the gym and again like making friends in the classes and doing things she's never done before. Anything to just get you moving is important and you, can, you don't have to always be in a gym. You know, if it's a case of just going for a 10-15 minute walk every day, if that is something you can commit to, that is a great starting point. As well as partnering with Pure Gym, British Heart Foundation is funding research to better understand the link between physical activity and heart health. During exercise, your heart starts to work a little bit stronger. So for example, the heart rate becomes higher. It can be two or three times higher during exercise compared to at rest. And it also pumps more blood, seven times more blood per minute compared to at rest. Um, so over time, the heart starts to become stronger and more efficient. A good way to think about it is like going to the gym and lifting weights, doing bicep curls. The more you work it out, the, the stronger that it will become. It's hoped that this research will lead to improvements in public messaging, as currently more than one in three adults do not meet the recommended guidelines on exercise. Right now, the physical activity guidelines are really one size fits all, so one recommendation for every adult in the UK. But what we're really keen to do is better understand in more detail how different types of activity, different types of exercise um, can positively contribute to our health. One of the solutions um, is through more personalised recommendations. British Heart Foundation funded studies are looking at how differences in patterns of everyday behaviours, such as the amount of time spent sitting or lying down versus being active, could impact heart disease risk. Wendy now sees how getting active is managing her blood pressure, giving her the drive to keep going. It's down and it stayed down, no medication. So I'm really happy really happy. Every five minutes in the UK, someone is admitted to hospital with a heart attack. And for many, it's a life-changing event. British Heart Foundation is funding research that uses AI to identify those most at risk in order to help predict heart attacks before they happen. We met with Professor Anton Yadis in Oxford to learn more about this pioneering approach that's now being used in some NHS hospitals. Professor Hava Lambos Antoniadis at the University of Oxford is leading innovative research funded by British Heart Foundation to predict heart attacks before they happen. 
by developing this new technology that uses artificial intelligence to characterize the fat around our vessels, we are able to say which vessel, which artery that provides blood to our heart is inflamed and which is not inflamed. And by doing that, we can calculate the risk of the patient to have a heart attack over the next period of time. The Acute Multidisciplinary Imaging and Interventional Centre, AMIC, at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford, plays host to this cutting-edge technology. So this is a hybrid catheterization laboratory in, uh, in AMIC. So this is the, the world's first cath lab that is linked with a photon counting CT scanner. So the patient has uh, the procedure, the interventional procedure on this, uh, on this table. And the table, the top of the table is detached and slides into the photon counting CT scanner so that we can perform hybrid research that combines intravascular imaging with non-invasive CT imaging. Some patients with stable symptoms of chest pain are referred for CT scans to detect coronary narrowing, but some heart conditions evade conventional scans. There are approximately 200,000 people every year who have this kind of, of test. Out of all these people, only around 20% comes out as having significant narrowings and we take action. The remaining of the scans, 80% of the, all these scans, they are just archived. Professor Antoniadis' research has identified patients at high risk of heart attack that might not have otherwise been picked up. This is now being used in the NHS and allows them to provide preventative treatment, helping to save lives and potentially decrease future emergency hospital admissions for heart attacks. The British Heart Foundation was one of the very few funders, funding bodies in the UK that funds early stage research. This is why the funding that is coming from the British Heart Foundation is so crucial for this kind of, uh, of, uh, of research. Heart and circulatory diseases are ranked amongst the biggest killers in the world, yet pioneering research using AI can offer a potential lifeline to those battling those diseases. Giovanni Amati's story underscores this truth. In 2013, cardiologist and personal friend of Mr Amati, Dr Hyde, recommended a CT scan, revealing severe calcification in his left heart artery. It's a, such a hidden uh, disease that uh, um, I was fine. I'm very athletic. I still was athletic then. Uh, so uh, there were no symptoms whatsoever. Uh, I'm, or I may have ignored them. In 2019, Giovanni had a heart attack, underwent an emergency procedure and attributes his recovery to his doctor. Six months later, he was one of the first clinical users to use the technology developed by Professor Antoni Ades, which used AI to identify the fat surrounding the arteries and see which ones were inflamed. On the basis of my initial CT scan in 2013 and compared it with one I took after I'd done my stent, um, the chances of having a heart attack um, drop from uh, like 30% to 2%. I know that, uh, well, my chances are, are pretty low now. And, and that's thanks to this amazing technology. Sometimes statistics help in, in order to give you peace of mind. Ruth Goss, a senior cardiac nurse with direct experience in patient care, works for the BHF to offer information, advice and support about heart and circulatory diseases. So ultimately, if we see this technology being rolled out across throughout the NHS and that's really going to benefit for the patients which is a really exciting thing to see. When we think of the numbers of people who are coming into hospital with heart attacks, if we can identify those at risk and prevent them from being admitted then that will help release any sort of pressure on the NHS and reduce those numbers of patients who are who are being admitted with heart attacks. I've seen firsthand how devastating conditions like heart failure can be. So with things like translational research, which is effectively from lab to patient, it's a really, really exciting area of research. We can 
what we want to see is the lab-based technology, so in this case AI, being rolled out to patients so that we can improve survival rates and, and reduce that impact of the, the devastating consequences of some conditions um, on patients going forward. Refractory angina is a painful and debilitating chronic condition that has a severe impact on a person's life. Shockwave Medical have developed an innovative device called the reducer that is placed in a vessel outside the heart through a short procedure and has the potential to help improve quality of life for millions globally suffering with the condition. Deepak is in his 80s. Despite a niggling hip problem, he can walk up these stairs. But it wasn't that long ago that climbing these steps brought on symptoms that felt like a heart attack. When I come up the stairs to the garden, there suddenly starts tightening of the chest and acute pain. And sometimes referring to the left arm, so I know there's a cardiac pain. He had refractory angina, a chest pain caused by an inadequate blood supply to the heart, which feels like pressure or squeezing in the chest or pain across the body. For the majority of people, their angina is treatable. But for others, like Deepak, it's severe, long-lasting and cannot be controlled by traditional treatments. It's often people who've gone to the end of the road with all the conventional treatments. So they may have had lots of angioplasty and stenting procedures, they may have had coronary artery bypass surgery, they will be on extensive medication, lots of anti-anginal medications. But despite all of those treatments, they've still got symptoms. I want to see th three hospitals and top cardiologists, and they all say they can't do much for me. I'll have to carry on with my medicine. But then Deepak met Dr. Hill. He suggested a procedure using NICE-approved technology called the reducer. It's a small hourglass-shaped device implanted into the main vessel that collects blood, leaving the heart muscle. It creates back pressure that increases blood to areas of the heart not receiving normal flow, reducing the symptoms of angina. It can be fitted in half an hour under local anaesthetic. Dr. Hill has been using this technology since 2013. A significant proportion of those patients now, and I'm still in touch with many of them, uh, have no symptoms at all. And so it's been an absolute transformation in their daily lives that they can go out for walks, they can play with their grandchildren, some of them have gone, have gone back to work. So it's a, it's a life-changing procedure for many people. Before the procedure, exertion caused Deepak chest pain, forcing him to rest. This is the hill right outside your house. Um, it became a huge problem for you, didn't it, trying to get up here? But now you can get no, up I'm, here. I can get up and don't have any pain or anything. How amazing. Yeah, it's, it's lovely, feeling lovely for that. Dr. Renil De Silva is a cardiovascular consultant at Royal Brompton Hospital in London, a world leading center for refractory angina. The reducer has mainly been evaluated in patients with advanced coronary artery, conventional coronary artery disease. And for that, we've seen that it is a significant game changer, with three out of four patients improving their symptoms of angina and quality of life as a result. It's estimated that almost two million people in the UK have or have had angina. Refractory angina accounts for five to 10% of them. Receiving the right treatment takes pressure off the NHS. We know from other studies that patients have reduced hospitalization visits, healthcare costs are reduced, exercise capacity increases. So all the things that are important to, to patients seem to improve after reducer implantation. If you're a patient who has still got very significant symptoms, speak to your cardiologist and mention to them that there are now 15 reducer centers in the UK and just ask to be referred to, to one of these centres to be assessed. Deepak and his wife have been married for 54 years. For them, it feels like life is blooming once again. It is more than one and a half year I have this and I never had any angina after that. I'm not scared of anything now. How does that feel not to have anything now? What do you think I should feel? I free. Free? Free. <laughs> feel free.
To discover heart conditions, cardiologists need machines such as MRI scanners, which can be expensive and are not always available in every UK hospital. VentryPoint have developed an echocardiography technology that is affordable, mobile and designed to deliver optimal treatment to patients more quickly than more conventional protocols. Eight-year-old Nancy was born with pulmonary atresia. She underwent surgery at just a few days old and is still monitored regularly at the East Midlands Congenital Heart Centre at the Leicester Royal Infirmary. But here, her cardiologist uses technology that's a game-changer in cardiac care and allows him to transform a 2D echocardiogram into a 3D model of her heart within minutes and with an accuracy comparable to an MRI. It's non-invasive, um, which, is, which is a reassurance. Nancy did, when she was a baby, had to have an MRI, um, and it meant that she had to have some dye injected um, so that everything showed up on the MRI. It was quite a traumatic process. So yeah, I, I'm thankful that we don't have to go through that every time, because we do come back between every six to nine months to get a picture of what's happening. The VMS Plus technology uses a sensor attached to the ultrasound transducer to track its spatial coordinates and orientation. A separate sensor also tracks and corrects for any patient movement. So breathe in and out and stop breathing and breathe away. The software then uses a patented algorithm called KBR, which stands for Knowledge-Based Reconstruction, to reference thousands of MRI scans and create a realistic 3D model of all four chambers of the heart, regardless of the quality of the images or the geometries of a patient's heart. It's quite nice because you just got to wait till they call your name and then when it happens, it's all fine and calm. And this technology doesn't just improve the experience and outcomes for patients, it also empowers cardiologists to diagnose and make treatment decisions faster. In Leicester, when we've been using this system, we're able to provide a much better follow-up for these families. It allows us to track the progression of these uh, children who otherwise I think we would be using inferior methods of looking at what is a very complicated heart structure. And one of the really exciting things that I'm starting to explore is actually taking it around the hospital. And in particular, we're starting to use it for our most sick patients who are on the intensive care unit, who actually getting that information about how well the heart is functioning can really help us with deciding on what treatment they get and hopefully improving their outcomes. You know, at the end of the day, Vic, it's really about the accuracy and the reliability of the results that they're obtaining and getting those results quickly. And VenturePoint CEO told me from Canada that as well as the technology being portable and cost-effective, it can also be attached to any ultrasound device in any setting. And it's especially useful for evaluating the right ventricle, which is hard to image with conventional ultrasound. There are issues, uh, especially with the most complex uh, cases, being able to image the right side of the heart, for example, uh, which uh, you know afflicts congenital heart uh, defects. If they're not able uh, to get a perfect image with other tools that are out there, they're not able to get accurate results. That has been the vision and part of the mission for the company. It's about working with healthcare providers and institutions to provide better, simpler, smart tools for them to be able to add to their diagnostic uh, capabilities. VMS Plus is more than just technology. It's a vision for better cardiac care, one which supports cardiologists in their decision-making and improves the clinical experience for patients and their families. Thank you for watching The Hidden Heart. We hope you enjoyed the programme. From me and from the team at ITN Business, goodbye.